two days ago we had quite a technical discussion and you survived as well. Thank you very much. Oh, we keep on with this with the same subject. We just uh, we're discussing with you metrics representations for linear maps, and in the course of that discussion, we just uh, discovered with you that there are two basically two different cases. One of them is a simpler one. The other one is a more involved one, depending where your linear map is is being considered. Uh, so this is the I brought this up from from Tuesday, I think. Yes, that's right. So if that's the that's something which I call metrics representation theorem. That's the one which proved that if you look at the map, we saw the slide already. I'm just do a bit of a revision given the technicality of the material we're discussing. It's, it's a good thing. Uh, so we, we had a map between two and tuple vector spaces. And we discovered with you that such a map is always implemented by matrix multiplication. Is always implemented like this. You can always find a matrix which will, does, which will do this for you. Not only we discovered this, the, this proof actually gave us the mechanism, the recipe how to, how to recover this matrix. The proof basically said all you need to do, you need to choose a standard basis in your, in your domain, Fn. You apply your linear map to, this, to every element in this basis, like I did here. These results you will come up with if you apply your t to the, every element of the basis. They by themselves will be n tuples, even though in a different n tuple space will be m tuples. As a matter of fact, if you take these m tuples as columns, that will be exactly the matrix you're looking for. That's all there is to it. Uh, today I will start with a simple example where I just follow these steps and I will recover the matrix. And then we will just take it to the next level. And then, then we're going to see how this same strategy, how this strategy, sorry, must be adjusted a little bit to work for the general setting. The general setting we spent so much time discussing two days ago. So one example first, simple example first. Well, wrong way. Yeah. That's the example from the yellow book, question two, part B. I mean, most likely, I don't remember right now from the top of my head, but most likely just a linear map taken from that question, but the question itself in the yellow book is a little bit different. So it's not about finding matrix representation. I just use the linear map in that question to, to, make, it, to make this demonstration about them. So the map is from one end tuple space into another end tuple space. So it's a simple setting from R4 to R3. This is a formula for the map from that question. If I remember correctly, as a matter of fact, in that in the question 2B, vanilla question 2B, just ask you to verify that this is a linear map. That's it. That's all there is to it. Uh, what I will do with this map, I will, I will show you these steps, how to recover the matrix of this linear map. It's a simple example. It will follow exactly the lines of the proof I just showed you, of the proof we, just, we discussed with you at length two days ago. Now I just follow these steps in this particular numerical example. Look at this. So that's the map which acts on quadruples, x. I'll, I take standard basis in the domain, in R4. In such basis, we will have four elements, E1, E2, E3, E4. I do not spell out the components of each of these vectors. I presume you know that what, what the standard basis means. Each of these E vectors, it's a quadruple filled with zeros, sorry, filled with zeros except for one place depending on the index, either first, second, third, or fourth place where you have unity. Okay, dokie, so this is my standard basis in R4. Actually, I'm wrong, I, I spelled it out. All of them here I spelled out. All four vectors, E1, E2, E3, E4. I draw, I mean, I hope you understand this. I'm sure you understand this, but I just, I'm, I'll, I'll make this explicit comment now. We use these letters, symbols, E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6, as many as you need, to denote the standard basis. But the, the usage of these symbols are not actually uh, unambiguous. Because if you think about E1 vector in the context of R4, it will be one vector. It will be vector like this. But if you, if you talk about 
E1 vector in a context on in a context of R3, say, the same letter E1 will stand for a different vector for the one which is one which is one one element shorter, one zero zero. That's the ambiguity which exists in these notations. Excuse me, guys. I don't mind you talking, but just make sure I don't hear that. Thank you. This ambiguity which exists in this convention. It's not really that harmful. In, the, in, the, in each context, you can see which exactly, or which vector we're talking about, but uh, just once and once I made this explicit comment. So E1, E2, E3, it's not, a unique, not, not an ambiguous notation. Depending on the context in which you write this, it may mean slightly different things, vectors of different length. Anyway, so here's my standard basis, and I specify the context. So this, on, on this slide, we don't have any ambiguity. Uh, so I just follow the steps from that proof. I apply my T to each element of this basis, and that's very easy application. That's a direct formula for T. All I do, I just use the components of each of these E vectors in this formula and see what, what I have. So if I use E1 here, it will be negative 2, 6, negative 1. And that's the result of my T acting on E1. I do my T on E2. Again, I just use the components of E2 in this explicitly given formula for T, and that will be 0, no x2, negative 8, 4. Here it is. Uh, the third one, when I use, uh, sorry, when I use the third one, ET of E3, again, I just use the components of E3 across this formula, that's 5, 0, negative 3, right? That's 5, nothing, there's no x3 in this line, and negative 3, that's right. And T4, T, sorry, T of E4, that's again, if I use E4 across here, no uh, x4 in this line, plus 2, no x4 in this line, so that's as simple as this, okay? That's all there is. We just use my T on every element of my standard basis. We have the result, and then the proof from the slide before just tells me I take these results we come up with, and I combine them into a matrix. So my T now will be a matrix implemented map where I combine all of these results as columns. So this is the first column of my matrix, negative 6, sorry, negative 2, 6, negative 2. This is the second column of my matrix. Right here, this is my next column, and this is my last column. That's all there is to this very simple setting. When you're looking at the map between n-tuple and an n-tuple, the matrix associated with this map recovered as simply as this. Yeah. Any questions? Now, I promised you two days ago that this representation is a matrix multiplication for a linear map. It works also in the general setting, where you're no longer confined to the n-tuple spaces here. And we built some foundation to see this property. We, we introduced some, some very important auxiliary maps, like J sub B or I sub, sub B maps from two days ago. Uh, I introduced also this general matrix type map two days ago. Now I'll show you how this works why any actually map within between any couple of vector spaces can be seen as matrix multiplication even though you don't you may not have any n tuples there whatsoever look at this and that's that's a slide which i call the matrix represent i'm sorry i call it yeah it, here it is matrix representation theorem Part two. So we'll, we'll again the it's a, one of these interesting one of these good results where the general discussion general proof of the result actually supplies you the algorithm how to do it in every particular instance. There are, there are a result in mathematics where the proof actually doesn't give you the way to find what the proof is uh, like the existence of which uh, or, or find the object the existence of which this proof is arguing. Unlike those results, this one, again, it's a very good one in this relation. It gives you the steps to which you can follow to find the matrix 
in question. So here's my general setting. I have a two vector spaces again, not necessarily n tuples, vector spaces. I'll have two bases again in which of them. In the V space, my bases will be B. In the W space, my bases will be C with elements W, bases in W. That's the setting which we already discussed with you a little bit two days ago when we discussed with you matrix type maps in a vector space setting. So here's my map, linear map. Okay. My job is to show you how you can see the matrix structure in such a map. Even though you see there's no any n tuples here, it's just arbitrary vector spaces, bases and stuff. You can see the matrix structure here. And look how easy we can do it given how like, given that the weight of the argument is now is, is now taken by the preparation we've done two days ago. Look at this. So my map is a nice picture I made here. My map is the one which takes T to W. Two days ago, we introduced two auxiliary maps which are linked to bases. One of them I called JB, the other one called IB maps. One of them was the inverse to the other. Here's the maps which we introduced before. JB map, that's the one which takes n tuples into V vector space, and it, it is linked to the basis B. That's the map which act, acted like this. It took n tuple of numbers and just built built a linear combination of elements of, of the basis with those numbers as coefficients. The second map we introduced two days ago was the map I sub C. Well, it's any, any basis will do, but I will link this map to this basis, to the basis C. And that's a map which acts in reverse. It took a vector here, it takes a vector here in W and presents the coordinates of that vector with respect to the fixed basis W, right? So in short, we wrote this like this. That's notation. It's the standard notation in the yellow book, which stands for coordinates of the vector W with respect to the basis C. I just gave this procedure now a new, a new spin, the, the vector, oh, sorry, the linear map spin. Okay, look what I'm gonna do now. I'm going to now introduce these two maps into my T, right? So look, my JB, what it does, it takes Fn into V, right? So in this diagram, in this diagram, I'm going to introduce this leg of action. Look at this. I'm going to say JB, it acts like this, from Fn to V, isn't it? And IC, it's a nice diagram to remember, actually. That's the one which brings everything together. IC, it's the one which acts like this from W to Fn. So my original T, it's the one which just works here between V and W. I introduced this new, these two new legs into my diagram. One is here, the other one is here. And if I now look at this action, this combined action, that's the action which in the formal language we call composition of linear maps, isn't it? It's the one which we denote with the circle. If I now look at this combined action of these three linear maps, that will be some map here, isn't it? If you combine them together. But let me just give a name to this combined action. I'm going to call it S. Wrong open. I'm going to call it S. So my S action, it goes between two n tuple spaces. And that's the one which, we, which combines all three together with the circle notations. Now, look what we can say now. We can say this. My T was of any nature, between, between vector spaces of any nature. But by introducing these two legs, J, B, and I, C, these two extra actions and combining them together, we come down to S, which is on one hand linear map, because, because composition of linear maps is always a linear map. We discovered this with you two days ago. And this new map S acts between n tuple spaces such maps between n tuple spaces, for them we know how to recover metrics. We just done it on two slides in general and in particular example. 
And that's what's going to happen with you when you do the linear maps on arbitrary vector spaces. You're going to be introducing these extra maps into the, that linear map, and you will be recovering the metrics of this new S map. And by definition, this matrix of this S map between n tuple space and an n tuple space will be that matrix which we will associate with this original T. And that's the whole picture of it. So, of course, this, this matrix which we will attach to T, it's not a unique thing. If you change a little bit the basis here, it will be another matrix. If you change a little bit the basis here, it will be again another matrix. So that re this result, this matrix of T, we're going to say it's a matrix of the map T with respect to basis B in the domain and the basis C in the co-domain. Changing one of those or both of them will change the result. But still, that will be that matrix. You will be looking in the yellow book on many occasions. So let me just fix the notation now. What I said before, I can say now, by matrix representation theorem, the first one, the first one I showed today, I can claim now that there is, there is a matrix of this size which acts, which implements my S as a matrix multiplication. And this particular A, I will, I will be touching this A to my T now, to my original T I started off with. So, yeah. And that's the notation we're going to use for that. That's a notation which resembles a lot this notation. That's a notation. So I can actually, I can even say, I can use this colon here to indicate this is a notation. It's a definition. It's a definition. And you see notation reflects this dependence I already told you about. This result, of course, will depend on the choice of a basis. If you, if you change a little bit your basis in either in the domain or in the co-domain, the result will, in general, be different. Okay, so that's just, it's just I spelled out this, the, the name for this matrix of T with respect, with respect to with respect to B in the domain and C in co-domain. Okay, now we still need to see how to recover that matrix, what's, what's the actual procedure of finding that matrix. And it's still on, it is on this slide. Uh, any questions so far? I need a drink. Okay, in our attempt to recover such a matrix, we will follow the same steps in, as in the, this simple version of the matrix representation theorem, right? Because all we need to do, we need to apply this simple version, simple algorithm to this newly, newly constructed map S. So what the, what, what the simple version says? We need to choose standard basis in the FN, we need to apply S to every element of the standard basis here, and then collect all of the results as columns. Results will be M tuples. We need to collect them as columns. So basically, it's the same procedure, but this time we do this procedure on S linear map rather than original T, because obviously we can't apply T to the N tuples. T doesn't work on N tuples. It works on some, uh, some abstract vector space V. So let's just try to do this procedure in general, and maybe we can come up with a smarter formula for, for the matrix. Let's just try it. So here we go. By, this, by the same matrix representation theorem, MRT just stands for the matrix representation theorem, all I need to do is this. I, my matrix will be, I just said here, the matrix will be such that columns of this matrix will be results of action of S, on every element of the standard basis in F n. That's just the line that says exactly this. Let's just try to see how this X, how the my map S actually works on the standard basis. So, because S is it's, it's a derivative map, right? It's, it's here. That's the formula for the map S. Oh, that's the formula for the map S. Why don't we just try and plug in here the standard basis vectors in the this, I mean, these standard basis vectors. Let's just try it. So, 
Mm, I need to I need to roll it up a little bit. Um, okay, let me. Uh, how much how much of my slide I need? Probably this this much will do. So uh, just spelling out that e one e two e n is a standard basis in the f n. Again, just to specify the context, so the symbol e n e two e one e n e two e n they no longer have e one e two e n sorry they no longer have ambiguity in their treatment. Uh, so right, so if I if I want to compute s of in fact you see I just I used on this slide I just use this express way of writing things so I, I'd like to I write this as if like I apply s to random element within this set so I use the index j here j is of course one of the one two and n if I use this formula for my s that's how it's going to look I just plug in here instead of x I plug one of these elements. But now I can I can take it a little bit further, can I? Because J B it's very particular map here. If I apply this map to an n tuple of E1 vector or E J vector in general, it's an n tuple which has all these zeros here except the jth entry, which is one. If you apply your J B to such n tuple in this long expression, what happens to this long expression? Almost every term will disappear in this expression. Only one will stay. The jth term will stay. And this jth term will be just the jth element of the B basis. So in fact, this inner, inner expression inside my T is just, do I have it here? Yeah, that's what I, said, what I just said. If you apply JB map to EJ, it will be just VJ vector. And so that's what we're looking at. This expression is just T acting on VJ, and the IC map, remember, is just the extraction of the coordinates. It's right here. And that's actually improved recipe how to recover the matrix now. What I say is this now. Do I say, well, J here takes any values between 1, 2, and N. Here, here's the improved recipe of how to recover the matrix. All I need to do, I need to apply my original T now, you see, no longer S. We no longer, we, we, in real, in, in practice, when you do this, you no longer need to go down to S. You, you can keep this diagram in your head, it, it helps a lot. But explicitly, you never need to write up this S map. This formula tells you that all you need to do, you need to apply your T to every element of the original B basis. And then for the results, for these results, which are elements of W, they are not n tuples. You can't collect them as columns in your matrix. No, you can't. But what you can do for these results in W, you can find their representation with respect to C bases. Those will be n tuples, and those you will collect into a matrix. And that's the end of the recipe. Now we're going to see how it works, but that's the general discussion of the recipe, and that's the end of it. Any questions? Okay, one extra comment before we go uh, to the example. Uh, I was trying to make this very explicit that this mechanism of, met of finding the matrix of a linear map, it works in a very general setting. I mean, if you, can, you can take anything in place of V, anything in place of W, any vector space, not necessarily n tuple vector space. It may be functions, polynomials, matrices, uh, other, well, you don't know any other, in, like a, in the list of the fundamental examples we discussed, that's all there is on that list, but it's still enough. However, from the practical point of view, in the many examples in the yellow book, in the yellow book, the setting where this mechanism you will need to use will be like this. The V and W, there will be n tuple spaces. There will be. However, however, the basis will be different from the standard basis. The same technique, it will still be applicable. It's no longer will be the simplified version when you use your T on elements of the standard basis and collect the results as a columns. No. This time you will be using your T on this randomly supplied or some, some other, not necessarily standard basis supplied, and, and then you will be finding the representation with respect to another 
basis or maybe the same basis supplied. So like I said, in the yellow book, most of the time where this technique will be, you will use this technique, it is when the V and W, they, are, they will be n tuple spaces, but the basis, which will come together with them, they will be given to you and they will be different from the standard basis. I'll show you one example of exactly the same nature. It's a question 68 in the tutorial book. Yeah, it's a question 68. So it's a map between n tuple spaces, like I said, given by a matrix. So in fact, it's a matrix, give, mat matrix implemented map. Uh -huh. The question goes to ask, uh, we need to find the matrix of this map, different to the one which is given to us, matrix of this map which is associated with the two different sets of bases. So for the domain, for the domain, we choose B, that's the basis which is supplied for the domain. Okay. These three vectors, they will, they will be the, as a set, it will be the basis in the R3, in the domain. And in fact, yeah, that's right. So the, the question goes to ask, find T, B, comma, B. So in fact, this B, it will work here and here. So in my general setting, C will be the same as B. C will be the same as B. Which, which is, uh, well, nothing wrong with that, actually. I never said that C must be different. If your vector spaces are identical, C may be the same as B, okay? So once again, the map which is given to us, it's already map which is implemented by matrix multiplication. But this time, we choose different sets of bases in the domain and the codomain, and we need to recover the matrix with respect to this set of bases. This matrix, which is given to us at the beginning, that's the one which, which that's the matrix with respect to the standard set of bases. So this one, in fact, this one, in fact, is a T, S, and S, where S is the basis, where S is this base. Ah, huh? well, S is this basis. The question goes to us to find the matrix of, the, of this of this map with respect to a new set of bases, B. Okay, so all we do, so my, my basis has the V1 vector. I'll, I'll introduce notations because it will be easy if I use notations. These, these will be my vectors V1, V2. B is the basis consisting of these three vectors, V1, V2, and V3. If I follow the steps from the previous discussion, first thing I need to do, I need to apply my original map to every element of my of the basis which is supplied in the question. So I need to apply T to V1, T to V2, and T to V3. That's the easier part. I mean, in the whole process, that's the easier part. So if I apply T to V1, that's the V1, that's how T or that's how, that's how T acts. We just multiply a vector by we multiply a vector by matrix A right here. The result will be the result will be this line three by this column it's zero. This line negative one, neg negative four, negative one, with these two it's plus four, take six, negative two, it's correct. And the last one I claim it's 12. It's this six times this negative one, it's negative six, and this three times this six plus 18, yes, it's 12. That's the T of V1. T of V2, the first entry I claim is zero, let's just see, it's if this line, by this line, it is zero, true. Uh, second row here in the first column here, in the column here, it's uh, negative four, negative one is four, take one is three, I agree, and negative three here, it's this line, and this row, sorry, this column, oh, sorry, last column. 
Will you? No, the other way around, sorry. If you multiply, it's the last row in the, in the second vector. So it's a negative 6 plus 3, negative 3. Yes, that's T of V2, T of V3. It's the whole matrix multiplied by the last vector. And it's easy. When you multiply by a vector like that, it just cut out the first column. So that's just 3, 0, 0. First step is done. We recovered my values of T on every element of the basis. We're not allowed to take this as columns, even though they look like entaples, and even though you may tempt it to do so. No. The strategy says, now we need to take this element because the, we, we, we're looking at the B basis in the code domain. If it was standard basis in the code domain, if, if, if you get, if you, rather than this, if you had the, if you were after the metrics like this, B comma S, if you were after such a metrics, the solution would, would be done at this stage because we, all we need to do, we need to take this, these three vectors as columns and that will be the result. However, in, the, in, this, in this question, we're looking for the matrix with B in the second place here. And for that matrix, there is still a few steps we needed to take. And here they are. We need to take these vectors, and we need to find representation of those vectors with respect to B basis. We need to find these coefficients, which are still unknown, which work for this identity. We need to find these coefficients. Again, representation of this result in terms of V1, V2, and V3. And we need to take, we need to find these coefficients, which work for this vector in terms of V1, V2, and V3. I index these coefficients with double indices in a particular order to reflect the fact that when we find these coefficients, when we know all nine of them, we take these ones as a first column of the answer, these ones will be taken as a second column of the answer, and these ones will be taken as the last column of the, and that's, that's the reason I index them in this way. That is exactly what I said on my previous slide. I find the representation of my vectors, these results with respect to my basis B, and these, these representations are taken as columns of my resulting matrix. So we, need to, we still need to find each of these. And you can't avoid doing this. We need to find each of these. Each time you do this, if you go after these three unknowns, it will be a, it, you will need to solve a system of linear equations, isn't it? Because this is a system of linear equations, the left-hand side of your system. This is the right-hand side of your system. This is a, it's another system which you need to solve. It's the left-hand side of your system. This is the right-hand side of your system of linear equations. And this is the third system you need to solve. That's the left-hand side, and that's the right-hand side. You need to do these three solutions. In practice, you can combine these three into one, one single row echelon form, and that will save you time. And I'll show you how to do it. Look at this. In practice, when you solve, for instance, if you solve this system with the row echelon form method, what would you do? You will extract the augmented matrix of the system, isn't it? What will be the augmented matrix? On the left-hand side, it will have columns V1, V2, V3. On the right-hand side, it will have this column. Symbolically, this is the augmented matrix of my system. B matrix where v1, v2, v3 are columns and the right hand side t of v1. That's a symbolic writing for the for that augmented matrix we need to solve for these three unknowns. When you go for these three unknowns, it will be another augmented matrix. That's how we can write this symbolically. B on the left hand side and new right hand side. And this is the augmented matrix of my last system. So if I need to solve these three systems, each of them individually, I would need to take this to the row echelon form. And given that B is a basis, right? B is a basis. It's the assumption. It means that when you go for the row echelon form, all of the leading columns will be here. There won't be any leading columns on, uh, to the right of the vertical line. That's, that's the nature of basis. Hence, when you do your row echelon form, those operations which lead you to the leading columns, 
they will be the same here, here, and here. And hence this efficiency trick. Rather than doing three separate row echelon forms, you can do one single row echelon form on this huge but one augmented matrix. B on the left hand side, and all of these three columns on the right hand side. This is the efficiency trick which will help you to do that. Well, in this particular example, this now, now I will spell out the matrix. I will spell out this augmented matrix. So there will be B on the left hand side and all of these T values on the right hand side. That's the spelling of that matrix. You can double check. Every column here, it's basically the vector V1, V2, and V3. V1, V2, and V3. And these are these three vectors. These are these three vectors. Now I need to take this to the row echelon form because I just pre I, I have pre-computed everything. I took it to the reduced row echelon form because it's easy to see solutions from the reduced row echelon form. I pre-computed this. That's what I have pre-computed. Quite, quite, expect, oh, well, quite expectedly, yes, right. O on the left-hand side, there will be identity matrix. If you have a, if you have bases, or if you have all leading columns, if you take and you take them to the reduced row echelon form, the only option is identity matrix on the left-hand side, because all your pivots are here. This is your pre-computations. Now, this right-hand side, we, which we pre-computed, uh, well, or which is the result of the reduced row echelon form reduction, now we need to interpret this, right? Where, where in this right-hand side, the unknowns from this system? There will, because this column went into the first position on the right-hand side, the unknowns in this system will be the first column on the right-hand side here. So these coefficients, A11, A21, A31, which we, we, which we're supposed to take as columns in the result, they're here already as column. These unknowns, which we're supposed to take as a second column in the result, they are here already as column. And in the last sets of still set of unknowns, again, already in the right place. So in fact, this result, which appeared after the Reduce row to the form, it is exactly the matrix we're looking for. This matrix we're looking for is right here. Yeah. That's what I said here. TBB is the matrix on the right hand side there. Well, co is coincidentally, the result is, is not, I mean, like a, I, I showed you the full way of solving these systems, if you, you probably, by looking at the vectors here, and by looking at these results, you could probably guess the solution straight away, because like you see we end up with the diagonal matrix, so this is a double of the first vector, this is a triple of the second vector, or negative triple of the second vector, and this is the three of these vectors, so uh, in this particular case, you could have probably guessed it, the solutions, but in general, you can't guess the solutions. You have to go all the way, and you, or you need to do the row echelon form here, unless it is pre-computed for you, or unless you have some other hints which suggest the row echelon form. And that's actually all you need to know in relation to the matrix representation of all sorts of linear maps with respect to all sorts of bases. The whole recipe is just we just done it twice. First, we discuss this in the general setting with this beautiful diagram. And secondly, I just done it on a particular numerical example. Any questions? You will do this a few times in the yellow book. In the course of the yellow book, there are quite a few examples where you need to find the matrix of a linear map. That's the procedure which does that. OK, so I have one extra example, which I call the advanced example. Basically, it's the same example we need to recover matrix of a linear map with respect to a couple of bases. But on that, on that example, we can avoid doing row echelon form because of the particular nature of the bases. And that's something we have discussed already 
in this example, I will just reiterate this so you remember it better. Uh, it's the same example, but I added two pluses here because I'll tell you why I added two pluses in a few moments. So it's the same example we just did today on this, my second slide. That, that was a map there. That was the formula for that map. For this example, we have recovered the metrics with respect to the standard basis. I added two, plus, two pluses here because now I'll change the requirement for the basis. So look what I'm going to say. I'll change, I'll take four vectors like this as the basis in R4. So that will be my basis in R4. That's right, and we will be after. Uh, wait a second. Ah, oh, yeah, that's right. So B will be basis like this. C will be the basis of uh, it will be standard basis. So that's the basis in the. Yeah, so this is standard basis in R four, R three. Sorry. What we need to recover, we need to recover metrics of T with respect to B and C. We need to recover T. B, C. This is a relatively easy task. Yeah, that's right. Oh, the interesting thing about this system, this system, that's the one which you need to train your eye to spot because it will save you a lot of time if you if you able to spot this interesting thing about this system. The interesting thing about the, the system U1, U2, U3, U4 is that it is the orthonormal system of vectors. So it's a system which has unital vectors. All of these vectors are unital. That's a very easy to check. And the other thing which is relatively easy to check if you do dot products, if you do dot products between any pair of such vectors, any different pair, so any pair of different vectors, sorry, it will be zero. If you spot something like this, it's a big game time-wise, because you, it will save you lots of times in many regards. For instance, if somebody asks you to check that this is a basis, all you need to say, every orthonormal system is a basis. System is orthonormal, hence, it is basis in R4. So that's why I encourage you to be able to spot these things if you can spot them. You can't, you can't prove this. It's just, just, a, it's just a train. You have, to, you have to have a trained eye to see these things. Okay, so if, I, if I'm after this matrix, I, just have, I have to follow the standard process. I need to apply my T to every element of the basis, T of U1. Is a formula for the T. Is U1. All we need to do, we need to compute this T of U1. Here it is. If I use this two, is if I use this four components in these formulae, I claim that will be the result. T of U2. That will be the result. T of U3. And there must be some way T of U4. Here it is. All of these vectors, they just came up by taking these values, these components of U, 1, U2, U3, and U4, in this formula, direct formula for my T. And that's the end of, this, that's the, end of the computation. Because if you after this matrix, where you have C as the basis for the codomain, the standard basis, all you need to do now, you need to collect all of these results as columns. T, B, comma, C is this matrix. I just took all of these computed results and plugged them into corresponding columns. First, second, third, and fourth. So in fact, I told you that 
if you spot that something is an orthonormal basis, it helps you a lot. In this particular computation, it didn't help us much. The only place where it helped us is just here, in this implication. Okay. Now, I'll take it one extra step. I'll introduce a, th a third basis. So we had two bases so far, B and C. Here's my third basis, W1, W2, and W3. I'm going to call it D. That is the basis in, okay. so that's the basis in here, in R3. And my next question will be, what's the metrics of my, do I have a question? No. What's the what's the matrix will be of T with respect to with respect to this pair of bases B and D? Half of the job is done for that computation because if you if you after this matrix, you still need to apply T to, to the elements of B, and we've done it already. One, two, three, and four. But this time, because you have D here rather than C. You will need, you can't take these elements as columns anymore. You need to find the representation of these elements with respect to this new basis, W1, W2, W3. So in general, that will be that row echelon form reduction three times. However, you can make, you can make another effort and spot that this set of bases is again orthonormal system. And that's the place where it will help a lot. Look at this. So, if you spot that the G system is not just a base, it's not just a randomly chosen base, but it's another example of an orthonormal system, then finding representations of these four results with respect to this new basis, it becomes a lot easier than row echelon form. It's something we discussed with you before. When you have an orthonormal system, that's a general statement, which we discussed with you before, any vector in R3, if you alter representation of this vector with respect to an orthonormal system or orthonormal basis, all you need to do, you need to compute these dot products. Yeah. All you need to do, you need to compute these dot products. That's a significant help. You don't need to do any row echelon form reductions. You just, all you need to do, you need to use your vectors. One, two, three, four, in these formulas with W1, W2, W3. And that will be your matrix. And that's why I call this double plus. I, I intentionally introduced these two bases to be orthonormal, to just to bring up in your memories this result. It's a powerful result, and if you spot that something is orthonormal, you can use it, and it, it will save you a lot of time. In particular here, it will save it will save you time, so, yeah. So if I, if I need to represent T of U1, that's a T of U1, as a combination of W1, W2, W3, these unknowns, I no longer need any row echelon form for those unknowns. All I need to do, I need to compute three dot products. This unknown, it will be W1 dot product with this vector. And that is negative 2, negative 2, and 1, 1. It's negative 4 on 2. It's 2, negative 2. It's a result. It's a typo, actually, here. It's negative 2, 0, and root 2. Similar story goes for T of U2. If you after the representation of T of U2 with respect to W1, W2, W3, these unknowns, you don't need row echelon forms for those. All you need, dot products, and that's the result. Six here, it's a dot product of the second vector and W1, isn't it? It's one and one, so it's a negative two plus 14. It's 12 by two, it's six. Negative eight here, it's a dot product of T of U2 and W2. It's, neg it's 1 and negative 1, so it's negative 2, negative 14, it's negative 16. By 2, it's negative 8. I'm happy with this. And this is a dot product of 
the same vector with w3, which is just negative 6 by root 2, right here. This way you can recover every element. Here's the recovery for t of u3. And here's the recovery for t of u4. If you now collect all of these coefficients as columns in your matrix, that will be, you don't have to copy that, it looks quite, quite large. Well, I'll publish the slide for you. That will be the matrix of T with respect to B, D, pair. I just collected all of these coefficients we have just found as columns. This two, this two is supposed to be negative two, of course. Negative two, it's the type of which I fixed here. Any questions? That's good. It's a, it's, a, it's a technical stuff, but we're over it. Now we can discuss further stuff. You will have some practice in the yellow book over this subject. Uh, yeah, you, you will. Thank you very much. We're done today.